What are the seven traps of path dependency? How do old ways of doing things keep us from finding new opportunities? And how can we use disruption as an opportunity to innovate? I'll explore these questions and so much more with Jeremy Gouche, author of Create the Future, Tactics for Disruptive Thinking. Jeremy, the average lifespan of a large company has fallen from 75 years in the 50s to 15 years today. You know, if I look at the list of the Fortune 500 companies from the year 2000, uh, more than 52% are now gone or displaced. Why is the rate of disruption accelerating and how can society, you know, deal with the negative effects of such acceleration? Well, the pace of change in terms of human progress, technology, the uh, barriers of entering new market have all sort of combined at the same time to enter a world where uh, you can disrupt another market or you can be disrupted. And we kind of get that when we see, let's say, the Ubers or Airbnbs of the world. But if you rewind a little bit, if you imagine life in the 80s or 90s or what it would have been like for our parents growing up, People used to use the word blue chip and imagine working at a blue chip company, which meant stability. And in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, life was more predictable. You knew what the world looked like this year, five years from now, and 10 years from now. You knew who the top five media companies would be, the top five in one industry or another. But now, of course, that's changed. And our world is globalized. The internet's connected us. Information has become more accessible. And you put it all together and companies aren't hanging on. So yeah, the lifespan of a Fortune 500 has dramatically fallen. And that's interesting because on one hand, it presents a bit of a threat. But on the other hand, it also presents opportunity. And the simple notion and the simple takeaway is that the rules of the game have changed. And now it's more important to better understand the rules of chaos and rapid change. And Uh, That's something I study, but I know it's not something that's really studied in schools. So I hope with Create the Future that these lessons about chaos can be very insightful for people as they think about how to navigate the roads ahead. So Jeremy, would you tell us more about yourself? And and in particular, uh, I'm interested in the anecdote you share in your book uh, about your dad. Um, How did your father's relentless pursuit and search for ideas turn into yours? Well, you know, I I was always an entrepreneur at heart as a kid, and it stems from my dad. And when I wrote my last book, Better and Faster, is in 2015, I handed it into my publisher. And, you know, you work on a book for a couple of years, and then you get your feedback all in one lump. And uh, I was kind of, you know, eager. What would my publisher say? And then he goes, uh, I really like page 86. Wait, what does that mean? You only what you did you only like page 86? And he goes, No, I had to read until 86 to hear the story of your dad, which you'd written in a page. And I realized, oh my God, this explains everything about Jeremy, everything about the business he created. Uh, you know, and I just don't know why that wasn't in the beginning. And so I flew back and I interviewed my dad and uh and asked him all the questions I hadn't asked when I was a kid. He was a, has a wild entrepreneurial story. Seven days after my interview, he had a heart attack and he died. And uh, that's devastating, obviously. But, you know, now it's five years ago. When I look back and I think about that, I think, um, you know, uh, I'm sort of lucky because if you knew when your father was going to pass away and you you knew which was the last weekend you'd have with him, what would you want to do? Probably interview him. That's what I got to do. So, now I look back, I feel pretty pretty fortunate about it. But yeah, do you want to hear a story or two from my dad? I mean, the easiest one that kind of explains what what sort of led to me was he was a little a little guy in a, a poor immigrant family, and they didn't have much. They lived in a one bedroom shoebox of a house that they he shared with his brothers and his mom and his dad, and they didn't have much, but they always ate well because my grandma, his mom, was a professional cook, and one day she's taken grocery store. And there it is, the Kraft Philadelphia cream cheese. It looks so good. Gets here. She's over there. Cream cheese is here. She's over there. And finally, when she's not looking, he unravels it, smushes it in his face. And he's like eight years old. And she looks over and she's mortified. This is the grocery store. She's a professional cook. She's a new immigrant in the village, like in the city. So she marches over, grabs him by the neck, probably doesn't even know what she's going to say, but she brings him to the storekeeper and then just goes, I caught this kid stealing. (laughs) Isn't that your kid? (laughs) But they sentenced him to a a month of sweeping the floors after school. And the little guy was only eight, but he couldn't help but realize that at the end of each week, 
it was really weird that the grocery store would throw away scrap food, food that was not really scrap food, but maybe it was uh, not good looking enough to have on the shelf, but good enough to eat, especially, you know, his perspective being a poor kid, poor neighborhood. So he was only eight, but he struck up his first deal and he agreed to sweep the floors forever in exchange for the leftover food. And, uh, he would then cart that around in his neighborhood, selling it at deep discounts to the delight of his poor neighbors. And pretty soon he was the first kid on the block with a leather jacket and a BB gun. <laughs> but um, it also really sparked something in him. And then he had this career, which I, is a much longer story. I won't get into it. But he had a career of always looking for the overlooked opportunities. And this idea that there's opportunity in people, places, things that others discard or, or overlook. And uh, in, in my case, hearing his story meant I wanted to be an entrepreneur so bad, but how do you figure out what you should do? And I had this upbringing where to encourage my entrepreneurial thinking, what he would do, which is a neat lesson for parents everywhere, is he would get every magazine and we would flip them open to the sections with new inventions. And the magazines could be about cars, trucks, fashion, tech, it didn't matter. We would flip the sections to the sections with new inventions. And he'd say, what do you think about that idea? What about that idea? Can we make it? What parts do we need to buy? How much will this cost? What would the reader of this magazine think? And I then had this upbringing where I looked at thousands of ideas and I made hundreds of little prototypes. And I really wanted to be an entrepreneur. But I think the problem with that approach is it also overwhelmed me because then, I don't know, how do you pick? And so I, I ended up really wanting to be an entrepreneur, but how do you pick? And so in university, I tried doing entrepreneurial things, but how do you pick? And I picked the job that opened up my options and eventually became an innovation guy just because I wanted to find my own business. Fast forward a decade and I was still looking for that business, couldn't figure out what it was. I was running innovation for a bank. I grew them a billion dollar business, which sounds good, but not to the 10-year-old kid in me that really wanted a business idea. Um, So back in 2005, I coded up a website called Trend Hunter, and it was before YouTube, before Facebook. So I had to teach myself to code, but I kind of made a digital version of that magazine, a place where people from around the world could share business ideas. And, And truthfully, I thought maybe a Trend Hunter in Europe or a Trend Hunter in South America might submit a little idea that would inspire me that I I could bring to America or Canada. But what I didn't expect is there'd be so many people, you know, lost searching for ideas, sharing ideas with each other around the world. And so our traffic went from thousands to millions to billions of views. And and now, you know, fast forward today, and my little accidental search for an idea has turned into the largest trend platform. Yeah, we inspire millions and millions of people who are looking for their idea. We learn a lot from it. And we've had a chance to work with about 700 brands now in their quest to figure out ideas. So that's that's a longer story, but it's what led to all of the insights in the book and, and really just this idea that maybe you're looking for your idea too, but it's so overwhelming. So how do you filter through the noise and realize there might be a better path for you? And so what I really wanted to share and create the future would be the tactics for finding that better path that that we've learned from having so much experience now. So Jeremy, what is an innovation accelerator? And more interestingly, how can one find an overlooked opportunity? Well, there, uh, there's so many great ideas all around you. And the issue would be that it's easy to dismiss the ideas that are awkward or different. In fact, you know, even something like Apple came out with their iPod. And I, I collected all the quotes that came from like Steve Ballmer, the billionaire from Microsoft, and uh, the billionaire founder of Palm, billionaire founders of BlackBerry, the CTO of Motorola, the CTO of Nokia. And it's just remarkable to see that even though that device looked interesting to us at the time, to see the market leaders and the way they dismiss a new idea is very fascinating to me. And so I've done the same analysis, even interviewing the people who you know, invented the digital camera from Kodak, all this stuff. And what you'll find is if you actually start interviewing and diving really deep in all these case studies, is that for the market leader, new ideas seem awkward. And it's not that the people at Nokia or Blackberry or Palm, it's not like the, the, you know they were aloof and that they didn't understand the market. It's that they'd already tried similar things 
They knew the constraints. When they saw the iPhone, they thought, oh, we at Palm, we already have a way for you to map all of your, you know, calendar. And, oh, this doesn't have that. And in the BlackBerry, they thought, oh, they don't have a contract that would let people transmit so much data. And th there's just an easy way to dismiss new ideas. They look awkward. We tried something like it, so we dismiss it. Meanwhile, when you're not the market leader and you look at a market from the outside, wow, look how cool the iPhone works. This is going to change the world. So part of accelerating innovation within your own world is to assume potential of these awkward little ideas, to recognize the blinding power of your own expertise and how in your industry you will underestimate new technologies and kind of overestimate your own ability to, to react. Jeremy, how can we recognize our blind spots and, and what is expansive thinking? Well, yeah, I think that what's interesting is to know that all of those traps we talk about force you, especially within your own career, to funnel and narrow your thinking to what you've done before. So the art of uh, the science of getting outside of the, the linear traps and, and, and where you're at really require you to look at your problem from different perspectives. And there doesn't have to be a a correct or incorrect answer to that. Um, in the book, I go through six different patterns of opportunity, which can be useful, but you can also use the example we talked about, about thinking about how would different companies approach your problem? How would, you know, how would uh, Facebook approach your market? How would Patagonia? How would Google? And uh, ultimately, what you're trying to do is run through more and more routines, more and more examples or case studies of how other other people might look at the same problem. And if you want, bring those other people in and try and broaden your scope of who's trying to solve the problem. Because fundamentally, what you're trying to do is uh, get out of the blind spots you have that are caused by your own success. Jeremy, very interesting conversation. And I appreciate all the insights you've provided on creating the future a disruptive uh, tactics for disruptive thinking. But I was wondering, how is all of what we talked about today applicable to the business of government and to the public sector in general? Yeah, we've had a good chance to work with a, a decent percentage of government clients. So I've worked in different aspects of the U.S. government, the Canadian government, the government of Dubai. And what I find is that uh, what's interesting about government is that all the same traps persist, those same traps of path dependency with an added layer of the fact that we need to tote party lines, we need to think of the next election, we need to try and defend our territory. And then what that starts to do is create paths that are even more ingrained, causing the repercussions of those paths to be even more uh, damaging. So the same traps exist, but often on a more magnified scale. So as the world around us moves even faster, it's pretty important to understand how those traps really, really work uh, in order to better make sure that government doesn't get far outpaced by the corporate world and by people. And certainly in, in this stretch of COVID, I think another upside, dare I say it, is that the tragedy and crisis has forced government, almost every sector, to move so much faster to adapt and address the need to quickly reposition. And suddenly people are recognizing how important government is because here government is bailing us out, helping us through, taking care and looking after our loved ones who get sick. And so I think COVID-19 has been an opportunity for government to step up, for government to accelerate, for government to challenge some of the things that hold us back, whether it's the normal pace of an FDA approval for a drug or, you know, or otherwise. And so uh, I hope we can use this opportunity and experience to continue challenging some of the rules and, and finding ways to, to help government move faster. This has been the Business of Government Hour, a conversation with authors, a special series focusing on leading through uncertain times. Subscribe, download, and listen to the entire interview at Podcast One iTunes, or on your favorite podcast app, and as always at businessofgovernment.org.